All right, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6. This is our last one in the series. Thank you for staying with us. And uh, maybe it's good just to conclude with the scripture that we've been examining for the last few weeks. Ten weeks, in fact. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. And so the final of this of the series is of eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. Now you'll see that he's really begun right at the very beginning, um, repentance from dead works, right at the, at the outset of our relationship with God. We have to turn away from dead works. We have to uh, come to him in faith. Um, then there is the, the four baptisms, then the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and then finally eternal judgment. And so he's taking right from the beginning through to the end. Now, the, uh, the issue of eternal judgment, and judgment is something that we don't like talking about. We like, like to talk about the love of God and the grace of God. But uh, the love of God has to be offset against his justice. The, the grace of God has to be offset against his judgment. Um, and so we, we can't just preach one part of the message. The message, uh, God's message, is, is an entire message which, goes, which deals with his goodness and with his grace, which deals with his goodness and his severity. In the Romans, Paul writes to the, to the Romans and he says, Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God. These are the two aspects of the nature of God. Um, as, as man in our relationship with our children, as, as fathers and as parents, uh, we tend to lean to one extreme or the other. We tend to either be too severe or too strict, or on the other extreme we tend to be too gracious or too loving. And if we do either of those, then obviously the, the children will not grow up with a correct uh, understanding of a father. They will, not, um, they, they will either become um, un unruly and undisciplined, um, or on the other hand they may have all sorts of complexes and all sorts of fears because they have been over-disciplined. And so we need to find the balance between those two. And obviously God is perfectly love, has perfect love, but at the same time he is absolutely just. Um, and so he has these, these two extremes. And of course, his, his, his judgment, we, we can't speak about judgment without speaking about the fact that our judgment as sinners has been passed from us unto the Lord Jesus, and that on the cross of Calvary, the Father judged the Lord Jesus, punished him uh, in our place, put upon him our, our sin, our guilt, and our shame, and the judgment, the penalty of our sin was laid upon him. Um, so that we can go free and in that we see also again the, the, the goodness of God but also the severity of God he can't just change the rules he, he does, he, God is bound by his word he's bound by his rules um, and so he couldn't just say look you know, let's forget about the sin let's just ignore that as though that never happened and let's, um, let, let's start all over again no in fact the price for sin had to be paid um, and Jesus pays that price for us at the cross of Calvary now you'll see that <coughs> he speaks of it as eternal judgment um, that, that word eternal means everlasting. There are, there are many people who like to teach uh, or who like to believe that God's judgment is not, is not eternal, that God will send you to hell for a short while and then once you've sort of gone through a, a, a period of, of, of pain depending on how many sins you've got and uh, depending on, on how many good deeds you've got then you, you spend a certain period and then after that God will take you out of that. Um, but, but God's judgment is, is not only final, but it is eternal. Um, and so it, it, is, it is something which will last forever and ever. It never stops. It never ceases. And so um, there, there are a few principles we need to talk about, about this judgment. Um, the, the first is that obviously everyone will be judged, whether we are Christians or non-Christians. All will be judged. Um, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says that it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And so as much as, as death, um, together with taxes, as they say, is inevitable, um, that's one of the things we cannot escape, death and taxes are, are there, it's a fact of life. And so n none of us will escape death, uh, obviously unless the Lord Jesus comes before the time and we are taken to be with him before we die. But other than that, everyone will die. And if we die, immediately after death, the next thing that we face is judgment. Um, and the judgment of God. Um, in Ecclesiastes 11, it says that as the tree falls, so it lies. Um, goes into more detail. It says if it falls to the south, it will lie to the south. 
Now that, that's a that's a, 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 a remarkable observation. Um, <laughs> that that uh, the, the way a tree falls, that's the way it's going to lie. But um, he's obviously applying. There's another application for that, and that is the way that we die. That's the way that we die. If we die unsaved, we 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 are unsaved for eternity. If we die saved, we are saved for eternity. Um, and so that nothing can change. As much as the tree can't des- decide, look, I'm not comfortable lying this way. Um, I want to lie another way. Um, so in the same way. You, you can't make up or change your mind after death um, we have this life and as much time as we have in this life we have to make our decisions um, and, and that decision uh, is final um, the moment we, we, we breathe out the last now in John chapter 5 it tells us who the judge is um, and uh, John 5 verse 22 and also verse 23 uh, it says that the father has committed all judgment to the son and so in fact Jesus will be the one who will exercise the judgment obviously as part of the Godhead as part of the Trinity um, the, the Father and the Spirit is also obviously intimately involved not, not one of them acts on his own Jesus goes into great detail to explain that nothing he does is, is, is not what the Father wants him to do nothing he says is not what the Father says anyway um, and so th- their judgment is one but in fact the, the Lord Jesus will be the one who will sit in judgment both of the believers and of the unbelievers. Also in John chapter 5 and verse 30, it tells us that God's judgment is just and is righteous. So God doesn't judge, and Jesus doesn't judge the way we judge. We, we, we tend to judge uh, depending how we feel. Our, our judgment varies from one day to the other. Um, and we even see that in, in, the, in the courts, not only of this land, but of, of any land. If you, if, if you end up before a strict judge, um, you, you'll get a stiff sentence if you in, end up before a lenient judge you'll get a lenient sentence um, and also depending on all sorts of other factors um, and so they, they, uh, but God is not variable, they, he's not changing um, his judgment is righteous his judgment is absolutely fair um, he can't be bought, he can't be bribed, he, he, he can't change his mind and so th- that is, a, that is a, a scary thought but it's also a very comforting thought um, and that, in that he will be fair, he will be righteous, he will be just um, but obviously for those who are on the wrong side of God for those who have never made peace with God obviously that, that, is, a, that is a very scary and a very serious thought uh, to, to consider and so <clears throat> let's talk about, uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and let's talk firstly about the judgment of the unbeliever and I'm just going to go to one scripture on this aspect and then we'll spend quite a bit of time on the issue of the judgment of believers. And Revelation 20 takes us right to the end of time, and this is the second, third, last chapter of, um, of the Bible. And it tells us in verse 11, Revelation 20 verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, you'll see that he speaks in verse 12 about the dead. Um, he saw the, them small and great standing before God. Now, we, when we spoke about the resurrections, we said there were two resurrections. The first resurrection unto life, um, which is that, that of the believers before the millennium, before the thousand years of peace. And then there's a second resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, um, because that is what they are called. They are called the dead. Um, now, they are called the dead because we, the scripture teaches us that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are spiritually dead until we come to Christ. Um, now, these people also physically died, so they were both spiritually and physically dead. Now, they are resurrected, so they, they get temporal physical life, but spiritually they still have no life. And so they are still the dead. They are referred to the, as the dead even though they stand on their feet before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and this is called the great white throne judgment. And Jesus then will judge them. And it's essentially whether their names are written in the Lamb's book of life or not. 
And obviously they, their names are not found there. Um, because these people are those who have never accepted Christ, uh, who have never believed on the Lord Jesus, and therefore um, their names are not written in the book of life. Now, many people say, well, what's the purpose of the judgment? Why do you then have a judgment? Because when they died, as we said, as it's appointed unto man once to die, then judgment as the tree falls, so it lies. So if a man died, or a, a person died as an unbeliever, um, then what's the purpose then of this judgment which then happens a long time down the road at the end of the age um, why is there then still another judgment um, well I believe it's simply to fulfill the requirements of the law um, and you'll know that even in, in, our, in our law there are, there are two aspects to judgment um, and so what will happen is a man may be found guilty um, and he would be pronounced as such by the magistrate or by the judge um, and then he will come back at a later stage for sentencing um, and so his guilt has been established now it's a matter of just, uh, just pronouncing the sentence now in here you see a very similar kind of process um, the question here is not whether they're guilty or not the, the question is simply um, express, exp for, uh, going through the, the legal aspect of saying your name is not in the book of life these were the opportunities you had to accept Jesus as your saviour you never accepted him therefore your name is not here and you are condemned forever um, and, so, and this is this is a, a terrible thing. This is a, a, a fearsome thing. Um, and and the New Testament says it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Um, and and this is an awesome judgment. It's one thing to be judged by an earthly magistrate or, or judge for a crime. It's another thing to be judged by Christ. Um, not just because he is a great God and because he's a great judge, because but because he paid the price. For our sin, we could have, we could, or trust not, not, not us, uh, but those who are at that judgment could have gone free. They could have had eternal life if they'd only accepted the fact that Jesus took their punishment in their place. Um, and so that makes the judgment even worse. So it's not just a, even a matter of being guilty, um, but what makes it worse is that the judge was the one who had paid the price for you to go free, and you rejected the liberty which he has offered. You rejected the forgiveness and the grace which he extended uh, while you were alive. Um, and, and so the, the judgment is a terrible thing. And you'll find there that he speaks about the fact that they are cast into the lake of fire. This is eternal, eternal judgment. This is eternal hell. Um, a terrible thing. And I trust that none of us will find, up, uh, find uh, uh, ourselves there at that time. Um, you know, and this is this is this is the main the, the, this concept, this aspect of the teaching of the Word of God is the main um, reason why atheists are atheists, um, why evolutionists are evolutionists, because they don't like to be accountable, um, and so they say, "No, well, there is no God." Um, the, God never made the world God never made things things just evolved because the moment we accept that God is um, the moment we accept that we have to accept accountability we have to accept that we're going to have to stand before him one day and give an account for the way that we lived our lives and for the, for the things that we, that we did but here the issue really is, is not how well I lived my life or how badly I lived my life the issue here is did I accept the forgiveness that was offered through Jesus Christ or not that's the issue. If I accepted his forgiveness, my name will appear in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I will not be part of this judgment. If I did not accept him, then obviously my name uh, will not appear in that Book of Life, and I will be part of this judgment. All right. Now, let's talk about the judgment of believers. Now, if we go to Romans chapter 14, and... <coughs> This is a separate judgment, and maybe uh, I trust I'm not confusing you, because the w great white throne judgment, which we just spoke about now, that's at the end of the thousand years of peace. Um, this judgment which we're talking about now for believers is at the beginning of the thousand years of peace. And we're not going to get into, into details to exactly where, but there's basically a thousand years uh, between these two judgments. Now, in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10, Romans 14 verse 10 says, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. 
Now you see he's speaking here about brothers. He's speaking about those who are believers. He's writing to Roman, to the Christians in Rome. Um, and he's saying we, he includes himself. Paul is included in this. And he says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is not the great white throne judgment which we've spoken about, and we'd have to go to many other scriptures to show the difference between the two, um, but if you can trust me on that, that this is a separate judgment, this is a judgment for Christians. And you'll see that he says here that, um, verse 12, so each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Um, and so, individually, every Christian, as much as every unbeliever, will stand before Christ at the great white throne, Every believer will stand before Christ before this judgment, which is the judgment essentially for rewards. The purpose of this judgment, and we'll see it in the other scriptures as we go along, is not to determine whether you're saved or not saved. Um, the purpose of this judgment is not to determine whether you'll go to heaven or not. The purpose of this judgment is to determine what rewards you will receive for the way in which you served Christ. Now, if we go back, remember the issue of repentance from dead works. Everything I did before I came to Christ is of no consequence whatsoever. All the good things I did, all the bad things I did, they, they were dead works. Um, they, did, they were not able to be of, of any value. And if we come to Christ, if, we, if any man be in Christ, the Corinthians says, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So really, as far as God is concerned, as a Christian, my life begins the day I give my life to Jesus. The day I am born again. That's the beginning of my life. That's the beginning of, of, of when the books begin to record the good and the bad that I do as a Christian. Up to that point, it doesn't count. Alright, now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, this is why this is important for us to, to have all of these principles, to, to, to have them all together and to understand them all together, because if you only have the teaching on uh, repentance from dead works, we can then get the impression that th I don't have to do anything. Um, I can do, I can, as long as I believe in the Lord Jesus, that's all that matters. Um, but that is not the end of the conversation. From the, from the moment I become born again, I now have a responsibility to live a, a life which is godly, to live a life which pleases God, and to do the things that He wants me to do. Um, and, th and for that, there is a judgment, and there are certain rewards. Now, if we go to 2 Corinthians 5, sorry, I'm not there yet, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. Paul says, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. Now, remember the, the, the basis of this. It's, it's not so that I can earn brownie points with God, or that I can uh, somehow um, earn merits with Him. Um, but because He's done so much for me, I want to do so much for Him. When I fully understand what He has done for me in, in buying my salvation, paying the price for my sin on the cross of Calvary, I have to live a life. Of, of, of worship and of gratitude and of service to him um, not to repay him I can never repay what was, what was the price that was paid on the cross of Calvary um, but it is simply as a sign of gratitude and saying Lord you've done so much for me the, the little I can do for you is nothing in comparison and I do it as an act of worship I do it because I love you um, that is the motive and so Paul says we, we make it our aim then to be well pleasing to him, to please the Lord. Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. See the same words that we read in Romans. That each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Now, he is then saying that we, we have to appear before the judgment seat of, of God, and he says there isn't a an, an element of terror in that. The terror is not in the sense that we may be condemned, but terror in the sense that you remember that, that the Jesus tells a parable of, of men who were given different talents. And this is a picture of the Lord Jesus. He says this man goes away into a far country, he's a ruler, he then comes back and he says now give an account. You received ten, ten talents, you received five talents, you received one talent. What have you done with those talents? And remember those who had taken the five talent, the one who took the five and he earned another five, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. 
enter into the joy of the Lord, and he's given authority over 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 cities. But the other one who took the one one talent that go, that he had been given by the master, he takes that and he hides it away, and he gives the one back to you, and he says, "Well, here's what you gave me in the first place. I did nothing with it." And you remember that the master says, "You wicked and you slothful servant." Um, you 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 knew that I sowed where, where reap where I don't sow uh, didn't sow um, and so he 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 deals with him very very harshly and so there is an element of dread in standing before God on that day and saying well he's given so much to us he gave us his son he gave us his spirit he gave us the church he gave us his word he give, gave each one of us gifts he gave us so many things opportunities time energy whatever all the things that he's given to us what have we done with those things and we stand before him on that day empty handed and we say Lord I, I, I did nothing I used those things to build my own empire to build, uh, to, 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 to put together things of earth, of an earthly nature. But I did nothing for your kingdom. I did nothing to please you. I did nothing to serve you. Um, and so Paul says, because we know the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But there's another aspect of, of, of that motivated Paul. So on the one hand, there was the terror of God. But on the other hand, there was the love of God. In verse 14, in the same chapter, for the love of Christ constrains us because we just thus judge that if one died for all then all died so he says that that the terror of the lord is one aspect but the love of God, of christ also constrains us forces us in a sense that word constrain means that 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 it is it, you you're you're constrained or forced put into a, a, a place where you have no options when something is constrained it's put into a narrow place and so he says i, I don't really have many options as to what i'm going to do with my life um, because the love of God has or the love of Christ has, has constrained me, put me into that place where I have to do what pleases Him. And so there are these two things, the judgment on the one hand and the love of God. Both of these things motivating and driving Paul, and they should be motivating and driving us. Now if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we've been in 2 Corinthians 5, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, and here you'll see exactly how this judgment works. Um, and it gives us um, a, a lot of uh, um, accu ac uh, accurate detail as to the basis of the judgment. Now, the context here is that Paul is speaking about working in the church, building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And he says, we are all different builders, some plant and others water. Um, God gives the increase. Um, and then verse 11, he says, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, or hay, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And so he is saying that we're all working, we're all building in the church. We have part to play in, in one way or the other. But some people are building with gold, silver, precious stones. In other words, things that will last, things that will endure. Others are building with wood, hay and stubble, things that are cheap but will not endure. And then he says that everyone's work, the day will, will test the work. Verse 13, each one's work will become manifest for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work. And so what we'll do is we'll stand before Jesus on that day as Christians and the question not, is not whether we're saved or not saved as we said. The question is what have we done for him? And you remember there's that little plaque that some people have on their houses. Only the things that, that are done for Christ will last. Um, and so the things I did for myself, the things I did for, for ego and for pride, even though they were godly things, those things are wood, hay and stubble. They will be consumed. They will, not they will not stand. But the things that were done for God in the right motive, with the right attitude, those things will, will, will last. They will stand the test. Um, and then he says, for those things there will be a reward. But then he says, what about someone who has no works? Remember the thief on the cross, for instance. He, he was saved. God, uh, Jesus said to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. But he had no time to do anything for God. Um, he, he died virtually moments after, after he was declared righteous. So what about him? People say, well, what about him? Well, he will, he will be saved. 
But the scripture says that he has no works, and so there is no reward. And so it speaks about, he says, if anyone, verse 15's work is burnt, now in the case of the thief on the cross, there is no work to be tested anyway. But if someone may even have served God for a long time, but in fact it, it, it has no substance, that is, that is burnt, but he will suffer loss. In other words, he will suffer loss in the sense that there is no reward. But then he says, he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. And so he'll still go into heaven, but he will receive no reward. And so we say, well, that's no big deal, you know, as long as I can get it, get to heaven. Many Christians tell me that. You know, all I'm interested in is I just want to get to heaven. Um, well, I, I, I don't think that that's, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's, a, there, there's a, a story I often share with people, and, and some may know the story, but uh, a, a thing that changed my life when, when I, was, um, I, I was about 17 years old, and I, I had gone to a conference um, in, in Bloemfontein of the church, and um, there was an old mission lady. I never, I still, I never knew who she was, and I've never discovered the song again. But it was the first and only time I ever heard the song. But she sang a sang a song one night, which changed my life as a, as a very young Christian. And the song basically said that when I see him, I wish I've done more, 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 so much more. Um, you know, and I realize that when I stand before Jesus on that day, and when I for the first time fully appreciate the price he paid for me at the cross, when I for the first time fully appreciate how, what, it, what, what was involved in my salvation, I wish I had served him better. And you know, then it's too late for regrets. Then there's no time to say, well, Lord, you know, I'll, I'll go back and I want, I want to serve you again. Um, it's only today that we have. And so over and over the scripture, both Old and New Testament, encourages us to work while it is day, because the night is coming when no man can work. In other words, we have time, we have energy today, but we may not have it tomorrow. Um, and so standing before him and saying, well, as long as I can make it into heaven, no, that's, that's not what it's about. Um, because when I see him, when I see him face to face, when I see those nail prints in his hands and his feet, um, I, I will really, I, every one of us, doesn't matter how faithfully we've served him, I, will, I believe there will be a sense in which we will say, you know, I wish I'd just served him, served him a, little bit, bit, a little bit better, um, and I'd served him a little bit more. Now, what are the things that will be judged? Now, I'm just going to go through this very quickly um, and not go to each one of the scriptures. But the, one of the things that will be judged is our motives. And so, as we've said, it doesn't matter how much I've done, if I did it with the wrong motive. And remember, Jesus speaks, and we dealt with this under the, 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 the heading of uh, dead works. He speaks about the scribes and the Pharisees, and they said, well, you know, we do all these things. We fast, and we give money to the poor. We do all those things. But he says, you do it so that men can honor you. He says, you've got, had your reward. There's no reward for you in heaven. Um, there's no future reward because you did it to get men's honor. You got men's honor, so you you got what you do, what you what you were out for. Um, and so the wrong motive is no good. So our motives will be judged. And uh, one Corinthians chapter four verse five speaks about that. The the secrets of men in Romans chapter two verse sixteen it speaks about the fact that he will judge the secrets. Um, of men, those things that are deep down in our hearts that we think that other people don't know about, he knows about those things, um, and those things will be brought out in the open. Those things will be judged um, on on that day. Obviously, if they've been, if we've confessed them before him and they've been for forgiven, then they've been forgiven. Um, but those things that are that, that are not um, uh, been dealt with and that we hide in our hearts and we think nobody knows, but God does know, those will be judged. Uh, Matthew chapter 12 speaks about the fact that every idle word, every word that we speak, doesn't matter whether it was spoken in jest, we will have to give an account. Because remember, words are very, very powerful. Words can build up and words can destroy. Um, and so those words that we speak, um, that hurt people, those words that we spoke that blessed people, all of those words we will give an account for um, on that day. The things that we have done, um, Matthew chapter 25 and 1 Peter chapter 1 speaks about the fact that we will give an account for how we, how we cared for other people. Um, those who are hungry of, the, of my brethren, Jesus says in Matthew 25, um, of our fellow Christians. Did we, did we see fellow Christians in, in, in hunger and we didn't, we didn't help them? Uh, did we see them um, in, in, in need and we didn't visit them? Did we see them sick and we didn't attend to them? Um, and so, how we lived our lives in relationship with one another. That we will give an account for. And then ultimately, in Matthew chapter 25, he speaks about the talents, 
and the basis of that judgment is on faithfulness faithfulness so it's not a, it's not a matter of how much we've done it's how faithful we've been and some some of us have many talents and God's going to require much more from us with many talents. Some of us only have one or two talents. We will be judged according to the few talents that we have. And so it's not. And so we can look at some people, some great preachers, who maybe have have affected thousands and thousands of lives uh, through their preaching. Um, and we say, well, they're going to receive a great reward. And maybe there's somebody. Um, I always speak about the little old lady who's who's never been able to. Maybe she's crippled or she's bedridden. She couldn't do anything. And she maybe she's going to receive no reward because she's done so little. And here's this great preacher. He's done so much. But you know, if she was faithful in doing what God asked her to do. Maybe she, all she could do was pray. But if she prayed faithfully, um, 100%, she will receive a great reward. That great preacher, if he was unfaithful in preaching, or he, 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 he was maybe faithful to, uh, to a certain extent, but, but he wasn't faithful all the way, he will receive a lesser reward than the old lady who was 100% faithful. So God is not interested in how many people we've reached or how great our ministry has been. Because remember, what we have, we receive from Him in the first place. So the preacher with the, with the great talents, God gave him those great talents. The little old lady with one talent only able to pray, God gave her that one talent. So he's not asking how great our gifts are. He's not asking how great success we've, 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 we've attained. What he's wanting to know is how faithful we've been in that one talent or that two talent, those two talents or the ten talents, however much he's given to us. And so the bottom line is, is faithfulness. And you'll see that's what he says. Well done, good and faithful servant but to the one who was who, who took the one talent and he hid it he says you wicked and you slothful servant in other words lazy servant you didn't apply yourself um, the way that I asked you to to apply yourself and so the question then is <clears throat> what rewards if we're all going to go to heaven then surely there's there's you know there's what reward can be there be that is greater than than getting to heaven well the the first i believe and the greatest reward of them all is also in matthew 25 just the commendation of the lord jesus christ you know people are driven by a need for recognition people are driven and people do the most amazing things so that people will slap them on the back and say you you're great um, you know, it's, it's, it's not even the money that they get or the prize that they get at the end of the day. Just the fact that, that people approve. People, uh, people are absolutely driven for the approval of men. And you know, I think we're all moved when we see men and, and women who have, who have, who have overcome great odds and won some great race or some great um, prize and, 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 and are recognized by the world. The world stand up and they say, what a great man or great woman. Look what they've done. Look what they've achieved. But you know, nothing can compare with the, uh, with the acclaim and the approval of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and that's what we need to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. That would be a tremendous thing, you know. And it's not going to be something that happens in secret. It's not going to happen somewhere in a corner. In fact, this, this judgment is going to be public because he says that which is done in secret will be shouted from the mountaintops or from the housetops. And that which is done in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hidden parts, that will be, be revealed to, to all. And so that's going to be a, a, an awesome day for some uh, who have done terrible things and wicked things. Um, as Christians, and there are Christians who, who, who don't live good lives and don't please God, um, but then it's going to be a great day for those who have faithfully served God, never sought for men's acclaim, or never sought for men's approval, but simply served God faithfully, looking for His approval, um, when He publicly um, approves. You remember Jesus says, if we deny Him before men, He will deny us before the angels and before the Father. But if we acknowledge Him before men, He will acknowledge us publicly before His Father and before the angels. And so that's going to be a great day when Jesus turns to His Father and He says, here's this, you see, you see my servant here. I, I'm identifying with Him or with her. They faithfully have served me. Um, and, and so here is, here is someone I'm well pleased in. Remember the voice that came from, from, from the Father concerning Jesus this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased hear ye him now we'll never hear those words in this life God is not going to do that for us but on that day maybe if we've been faithful we will hear his voice declaring before the whole world before all principalities and powers and the angels here's, here's uh, whoever um, here's this, this man or here's this woman I'm well pleased in them 
uh, they've been good and faithful servants of mine. That's a great reward in itself. And then, of course, in, in Luke chapter 19, it speaks about ruling cities. Um, and during the millennial reign of Christ, those who have been faithful, um, they will be given authority to rule over cities. Um, some of us will maybe get uh, a suburb to look after. Um, uh, some of us will get cities. Some of us may get larger areas. Um, some of us may get nothing. Um, but depending how faithful we've been, and that's just a principle which is, which is taught there. And then finally, in um, uh, 2 Peter chapter 4, um, Paul talks about, he says, Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And there are a whole lot of other scriptures, Revelation chapter 3, 11, Revelation chapter 4, verse 24, um, various other scriptures that speak about a crown that we're going to receive. Um, now, we say, well, you know, that surely that's sort of materialistic. What do you want to do with a crown in heaven? Um, you know, as long as, again, as I said, as long as I can just get into heaven, that's all that matters. Um, but again, if we read in Revelation 4, what they do with these crowns is they throw the crowns at Jesus' feet. And so the crowns we receive is not to say, look, you know, my crown's bigger than your crown. Um, but the crown we receive is so that we can have something to throw at his feet in, in worship and adoration. Because remember, we're now in heaven and we've not been able to take anything from this earth. And so we can't take some money or gold or whatever from this earth and say that when we get to heaven, then we'll have something to throw at his feet. No, in fact, we, we go, all we will have is what we receive on the day of, of judgment. And so if he gives us that crown, we'll have something to throw at his feet. And Revelation 4 says that they throw the crowns at his feet and they say, you are worthy to receive blessing and honor and glory. Um, and so it would be a terrible thing to stand before him on that day and, and the crowds are throwing crowns at his feet, worshipping him with these things. And we stand there empty handed, having nothing to give, uh, nothing to worship him with, because in fact we have been slothful and we've been slack in our service of him. And so why is this an important uh, principle? Because all of these principles must underlie our lives. And, and as much as if we just go back to the first principle of repentance from dead works, as much as every moment of the day I must be aware that I can't do anything to earn my salvation. I can't do anything to earn blessing from God. That is something that must be a principle which is fundamental to my life, foundational to my life. That must be there all the time. Um, but at the same way, in the same way, each of those principles must be present in my life all the time. It must be foundational to all my motives and my actions and the things I do and the things I don't do. But at the, one of the other things that must be there is the awareness that I'm going to have to give an account. That I'm not living a life which is just aimless and without purpose. And that somehow I can just live my life in a careless way. Um, but I need to live my life knowing that I'm going to have to give an account for, for all of my time, for all of my gifts, all of my talents, everything that God has given to me. He's going to require an account of those things. And you know, it's, it's quite scary because how few Christians understand this principle. Because when you look at their lives, you see that their lives are lived selfishly. Their lives, everything in the, about them, they, everything they have, they, everything they own, all their gifts, their talents, their abilities, their time, their financial resources, it's all used for selfish purposes. And they live as though there is no judgment. But when, when this becomes real, when this becomes part of the foundation in our lives, we're, we're aware that yes, God doesn't want us not to enjoy our lives. He doesn't want us not to, to have times of recreation and to have nice things. But at the same time, we need to live in such a way that we recognize that, that everything that I do is being recorded. The books will be opened. Everything that I say will be recorded. Um, and I will have to give an account for those things. And so let me live a, my life in such a way. And so Paul says that, that knowing the terror of the Lord, he says, I fulfill my ministry, I persuade men, but also the love of Christ constrains me. And so, do we just want to receive rewards? Um, or do we need to serve Him because He because he's first served us do we need to love him because he first loved us and you know as we've said we, we can't repay what the price he paid for us we can't give him back a, a fraction of what he's done for us but he's done so much for us he's worthy of everything we're able to bring he's worthy of everything we're able to give him in terms of, of serving him and of blessing him and remember it's not just what we do for him airy, in an airy fairy style many people think yeah you know well you know how can I do things for him but you know what I do to the church what I do for the church these are things that are being done for him if I, if I remember Paul Jesus says to Paul 
Paul, you're, you're persecuting me. But in fact, Paul was not persecuting Jesus physically. He was persecuting the church. But in the process, he was persecuting the Lord Jesus. In the same way, as we bless the church, as we bless other Christians, we are in fact blessing the Lord Jesus. As we serve one another as brothers and sisters in the faith, we are serving the Lord Jesus. And he recognizes all of those things. And so God give us grace that we may look at our lives and say, am I ready for this, for this judgment? You know, the same way as, as when you have to write an exam at the end of the year, um, it's no good getting to the day before the, end of the, before the exam and say, well, I don't know whether I'm ready. Um, and that's why schools and other places will give you tests along the way to prepare you and say, well, am I, am I ready? And you need to examine yourself and say, well, um, will I, am I on schedule with my studies? Will I make it uh, when, when I get to the test? Um, and in the same way, um, Paul encourages us on a number of occasions to examine ourselves, to say, well, where am I? Am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I living my life in, a, in the way that he wants me to live? So that when I get to the day of judgment, I'm not suddenly caught by surprise. And so let me examine myself, he says, because when I judge myself, he says, that's better then I come to the judgment and God then has to judge me. And so let me judge myself. Let me be hard on myself. That's really what he is saying. Um, lest the Lord have to be hard on me um, so that I may stand before him on that day, not ashamed, um, but that I may hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross and Lord we, we recognize that none of us deserve that and Lord at the same time none of us can repay that because that is a price too awesome uh, and too great to contemplate there is no, just no way we can repay you for what you've done for us and so Lord we pray that you would just generate within our hearts and through, and through your spirit just pour out your love upon us and in our hearts Lord that we may understand that in fact you've loved us so much that we need to love you in return that you've done so much for us, Lord, that we need to lay our lives at your feet in service and in worship and in adoration. And so, Lord, help us to indeed come to terms with these things, that we are not our own, but that we've been bought with a price, and that we belong to you, and that we may use our time, that we may use our talents, that we may use our abilities, that we may use our resources to serve you. And, Lord, that we may on that day hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, some of us may never have been acclaimed by men in this life, we never have received any recognition during our lives here on earth. But Lord, that doesn't matter because what we want is we want your acclaim. We want your recognition. We want to hear you acknowledge us before your Father and before the angels in heaven. Help us, Lord, to, for this not just to be a theory or something that we, we read about in the scriptures, but Lord, that it may become a principle and a foundation in our lives, that we may live our lives in awareness of this as much as we are aware of the fact that you saved us by your grace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.